Now, won't you turn in the Word of God to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7. You'll find it on page 240 in the Old Testament, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7. Some time ago, I read of a man who had been a prominent preacher and evangelist who had backslidden, if that's the right word, both theologically and morally, and uh, had been in the, in the spiritual wilderness for many years. Um, a reporter from a Christian magazine contacted him for an interview And in the course of the interview, asked the question, how do you feel about Jesus now? And his response was a very telling one. He said, I miss him. I miss him. I wonder if you were pressed for an answer to that question, whether you would need to say or be able to say, Uh, I miss him. Somehow there's a distance that has come about between you and the Lord Jesus. William Cowper wrote a wonderful hymn that expressed this missing Christ. He said, where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? The peaceful hours I once enjoyed, how sweet their memories still, but they have left an aching void the world can never fill. The passage before us this morning offers hope to believers and to churches who find themselves in this position. And if you you this morning would honestly in your heart kind of say, I I miss him. There's uh, something of an aching void in me then this passage can be a real encouragement and help to you and indeed to us. So if if you're serious about coming back to God, if you've drifted away for whatever reason, hurt or pain or disappointment or sin, uh, this passage tells you how you can come back to God. As Ryan reminded us last Sunday, uh, 1 Samuel chapters four through seven are a unit bracketed on the one hand by uh, accounts of Israel's ignominious defeat at the hand of the Philistines, and on the other hand, in chapter seven, by a glorious God-orchestrated victory. Now, the key word in chapters four to six, and you would pick it up if you read those at one sitting, the key word in those chapters is the word ark, A-R-K. The ark is mentioned 35 times in chapters four to six. The ark of the covenant, as it was called, was that gold-covered box or chest. I think uh, Ryan showed you a picture of it on the screen last week and I the week before that. In that chest were the two tablets of stone bearing the inscription of the Ten Commandments that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai. The lid on that box was called the mercy seat or the atonement cover. And coming up from both sides of that lid were images of cherubim, kind of like angels. Their wings were stretched out and their wings touched above the ark. And if you glance at chapter four, verse four, it says that God's, that God was there enthroned between the cherubim. Uh, The ark was sort of the the physical dwelling place, if you like, of God on earth during that period. Now, in chapter four, we we saw that Israel was defeated because they, they tried to use the ark as a weapon of war. When the Philistines came against them, They defeated them the first time and they thought, well, we'll sort them out this time. We'll take the ark with us into battle. We'll take God with us into battle. 
and he will sort out the Philistines. And they were defeated. Chapter five uh, recounts the, the capture of the ark by the Philistines. It was taken, you remember, and placed in the temple of Dagon, their god. And the next morning, Dagon was flat on his face before the ark. They picked him up and put him back in his place. And the next morning, there he was again, flat on his face. This time, his hand, his hands and his head broken off. And then they decided that they would move him around from city to city. And everywhere they moved the ark, illness broke out. People developed tumors. So the ark was passed around the country like a, like a kind of hot potato. And eventually, they decided to send it back to Israel. And you remember how they put it on a cart with two cows that had recently calved, penned up the calves, and they said, if, this, if these cows head for Israel and carry this thing across the border, we'll know that this pain brought about by having their God among us was really from God and not just by chance. And so the ark was carried across into Israel to a town called Kiriath Jireh. And there when people opened the ark in violation of God's command, when they act, acted irreverently, 70 of them were killed. And so they shunted the ark off to this little town, put it in the house of a man named Abinadab, and it stayed there for the next 20 years. 20 years. And the key text in chapters four to six is the text in 620, who can stand in the presence of this holy God? Now as we come to chapter seven, the main idea in chapter seven is that of restoration. And the key word in chapter seven, interestingly, is the name Samuel. The ark the key word in chapters four to six, 35 times. The name Samuel, the key word in chapter seven, nine times. And in this chapter, we find Samuel leading the people back to God, back into an experience of God's great mercy. So what we're gonna do this morning is look at not the whole chapter, but most of it, and we're going to think about the preparation for God's mercy. We're going to think about the manifestation of God's mercy. And thirdly, about the commemoration of God's mercy. Just to give you a bit of a heads up so you don't get worried that you're going to miss work tomorrow. I'm going to camp on point number one and spend most of the time there. And then we'll have a little bit of time on point number two, a little bit of time on point number three, and point number four, you can develop on your own at home. So that's where we're going, just so you don't get worried uh, when we spend a lot of time on number one. But let's dive in and think about the preparation for God's mercy. God's mercy is not given without due preparation. And so what was involved in preparing Israel to once again experience the mercy of God? And the two key words and the first word is the word desperation. And I want you to look with me at the second part of verse two, which says, then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. The English Standard Version is probably a better translation at this point. It says, all the people of Israel lamented after the Lord. It's a better translation. The word lamented is a better translation because it captures the idea of longing, of remorse, of desperation, lament. They lamented after the Lord. Uh, the message translation helps us grasp what was happening. It reads, throughout Israel, there was a widespread fearful movement toward God. I like that. Throughout Israel, a widespread fearful movement toward God. Fearful because 
who can stand in the presence of this holy God? Now, what led to this desperation? And the opening word of that uh, second part of verse two gives us a clue. It says, then all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord their God. Then, that, when, when you read the word then, then you look back to, well, what, uh, what happened before that? Verse two says in the first part, after a long time, 20 years in all, then the people turned back to the Lord their God. So after a long time, one by one, people started saying, I miss him. After a long time, people started acknowledging that the aching void in their hearts was because they were far from God. And what contributed to that? There were two things. One was the Philistines controlled them. And the passage makes that clear, particularly in verses 13 and 14. They were not a free people. The Philistines had defeated them twice in chapter four. And from then on, for the next 20 years, Israel was a nation dominated by the Philistines. They were not a free people. They couldn't do their own thing. The Philistines built forts strategically in the nation of Israel to monitor their behavior. I imagine they had their secret service making sure that the Israelites towed the line. They didn't allow blacksmiths to practice their trade in case they took farm implements and transformed them into weapons. That's the degree of control that they had. The Philistine gods became part and parcel of life in the nation of Israel. And then secondly, during these 20 years, the Israelites had little or nothing to do with the Lord. The ark, we're told, remained in Kiriath Jirem, a little dorpy, a little backwater in Israel. The ark remained in Kiriath Jirem and the people lived without regard for it or without regard for what it stood for, their, their covenant relationship with God. The ark was in the country. It had been brought back from the Philistine territory, but it wasn't central, as it had been when it was in Shiloh. You remember when the ark was in Shiloh, it was in the tabernacle. When the ark was in Shiloh, Elkanah and his wife Hannah and his wife Penana and her children would come year by year along with many others to worship. Eli was the high priest. His scoundrel sons were his deputies. But it was, the, it was the focus of religious life in the country, but no more for 20 years. Shiloh had been destroyed and the ark was in Kiriath Jireh. And instead of following the Lord, they began increasingly to adopt the Philistine ways under pressure, worship the Philistine gods. So in summary, for a long time, the Philistines had shaped their lives and God's, God was peripheral. He was present, he was in the country, as it were. The ark was in the country, but it was peripheral. So I thought about that, I thought, it's possible for that to be a description of the life of a Christian. It could be a description of your life. It could be that your life, if you're honest, is shaped more by the world around you than it is by the God within you and his word that he's placed in your hands. You can be giving your life to the same gods that the world does. God can be present but peripheral. Maybe it's been a long time. Maybe not as long as 20 years, but maybe, maybe it has been. Maybe it's been five years. Maybe it's been a year. And your life is shaped by the world and God is somewhere in a corner. 
But maybe you've begun to miss him. Maybe you've begun to feel that aching void that the world can never fill. Maybe you're lamenting, saying there must be more than this. There's gotta be more than this. And when desperation begins to set in, there's hope. That's the good news of this passage. Now in our passage, desperation is followed by direction. And so in response to their growing desperation, the voice of the prophet Samuel is heard once again. Samuel, interestingly, Samuel is not mentioned from the beginning of chapter four to the end of chapter six. Through all that stuff with the ark being captured by the Philistines, the ark wreaking havoc amongst the Philistines, the ark being brought back to Israel, the stuff that happened when they peeked into the ark, in all of that, no mention of Samuel. Where was Samuel during those 20 years? We're simply not told. But given Samuel's track record, both before and after these chapters, I am pretty sure that during those years, Samuel was a heartbroken prophet who moved around among the people from his home base in Ramah, urging people like Jeremiah would do later on in Jerusalem where he ministered for 40 years when hardly anybody listened to him. I think Samuel moved around heartbroken at what he was seeing, calling people to, back to God, but for the most part, his message fell on deaf ears and there was little response. But now he had begun to see the, the, the green shoots of desperation in this spiritual desert of Israel. And he was encouraged by what he saw. And so he comes and he gives direction. Look at verse three. So Samuel said to all Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtaroths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. John Woodhouse calls verse three the gospel according to Samuel. I like that. And it is that the gospel according to Samuel. It's a call to repentance and a promise of mercy. That's really what the gospel is. It's a call to repentance and a promise of mercy and that's what Samuel says before them. Now it's interesting, Samuel didn't assume that their lamenting amounted to true repentance because he knew that people could be remorseful because of stuff that happened to them as a result of their sin without necessarily being repentant of their sin. And so he says to them, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, if this lamenting, if this, if this longing is genuine, then he says, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtaroths and commit yourselves. And the, the ESV is also good there it says, direct your hearts to the Lord. I like that. Direct your hearts to the Lord. Commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. You see, repentance is not just weeping and wailing. It's not just feeling sorry. Repentance is returning to the Lord with all your heart. And what does it mean? What does it look like? Well, Samuel spells it out in two, in two ways, two sides of a coin, if you like. He says, he says to them, rid yourselves of the foreign gods, the Baals and the Ashtaroths. Baal was the Canaan god of the storm. And when the Canaanites needed rain, they would offer worship to Baal, the god of the storm, trusting that he would provide rain in order for their crops to grow. Asheroth, on the other hand, was the goddess of fertility. And the worship of Asheroth involved all kinds of sexual and sensual rituals, uh, unimaginable stuff. And so true repentance involved 
an exclusive, single-minded, wholehearted rejection of those idols and a similar commitment to the Lord. And those are the two sides of the coin of genuine repentance. They always are. There's the casting down of idols and there's the clinging to God. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and he talked about what had happened in their lives, he reminded them of what happened when the gospel came to them. He said, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what repentance is. And that's what Samuel was calling for here. Now, maybe, maybe this morning you are not yet a Christian. I want to say that if you're not yet a Christian, the Christian life begins with repentance. Repentance is the first word of the gospel. When John the Baptist began his ministry as the, as the herald or the forerunner to Jesus, he, he came, Scripture says, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus began his ministry after his baptism and temptation in the wilderness, the first word of his preaching was repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The Greek words uh, for repentance have the idea of a change of mind. Change of mind, metanoia, change of mind. But repentance is more than just a change of mind. It's a it's a complete, it's a reorientation. It's a spiritual U-turn, if you like. I think I've told you about the experience Irene and I had when we were visiting uh, an aunt and uncle of hers in Denmark. They couldn't speak English and I can't speak Danish and Irene remembered a little bit of Danish from her childhood. It started coming back. And uh, as we were with this aunt and uncle up in the north of Denmark, um, as we spent time with them muddling along, uh, using the dictionary to help us, we began to sense, I wonder if they are Christians. We, we just had a sense in our spirit that this, this couple knew the Lord. And so we decided to probe a little bit. We were sitting down at the kitchen table one day. I'll never forget it because in these Danish farmhouses, they, they, he was a pig farmer, and the, the kitchen was here, and you opened the door, and you went through into the pig barn. And... Uh, that resulted in there being quite a few guests at the table in the form of flies. And so there were lots of flies around, and I remember that very vividly because it just kind of gave me the creeps. But we, uh, we, 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 we were trying to figure out where they were spiritually. And eventually I had the idea of uh, looking up in the, in the English-Danish dictionary the word conversion. So I found the word conversion, pointed it to them, and I'll never forget Irene's uncle said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he went like this, And we said, yeah. And he mentioned a particular date where they had turned around, where there had been repentance. John Wesley spoke of repentance as the porch of religion. What did he mean by that? See, like Repentance is like the front veranda. When you come into the Christian house, you come, the first thing that needs to happen is repentance. The door is faith, and inside is new life. He also went on to say that repentance is not something that you do just at the beginning when you come to Christ, but repentance needs to become a way of life. And the truth is, the more we grow in grace, the more Christ-like we become, the more conscious we become of our sin and the more repentance does become a way of life. So Samuel's call to Israel was a call to repentance. He says, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And then the promise of mercy follows and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, an idol or a foreign god is a, is a substitute for God. As we've seen, the Jews in that period gave themselves to worshiping Baal and Ashtaroth. But believers today 
we can worship idols in a more subtle way. We can have our own attractive gods and they can be in the form of houses and land and worth, wealth and work and cars and gadgets and leisure and pleasure and people. They can be, not that those things are all wrong in themselves, of course not. But whatever becomes the center of the country, that's the idol. And if the Lord is relegated to some little Kiriath Jairam village on the periphery of our lives, then we're as guilty of idolatry as the Israelites were. Maybe it's good to take a few moments to just ask yourself, where, where is the Lord? Is, is he in the center of your life? You say, oh, he's there, but is, is he tucked away in some little Kiriath Jairam? having very little influence on the way you think, the decisions you make, the way you live life in the workplace, in the home, in your marriage, in your relationships. It can happen. And finding yourself in that place, you can begin to say, well, I, I miss him. I have an aching void. Dale Ralph Davis said that repentance will always move beyond wet eyes and stirred feelings and moved emotions. Repentance will cast down idols and cling to the only God. In that same hymn that I quoted from earlier, William Cowper goes on and he says, return, return, O holy dove, a reference to the Holy Spirit, Return, O holy dove, return, sweet messenger of rest. I hate the sin that made you mourn and drove you from my breast. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. That's a profound verse, that. The dearest idol. What is the dearest idol? What is the thing that you'd be most reluctant to let go of, but you know that's got to change if Christ is to be the center of your life? The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from throne. Get rid of, is what Samuel said. It's, it's, it's a, there's a ruthlessness about it. And worship only thee. Look at Israel's response in verse four. So the Israelites put away their bowls and ashtoreths and served the Lord only. Now they were ready to be led into the future. So what happened next? Look at verse five. Then Samuel said, assemble all Israel at Mizpah and I will intercede with the Lord for you. And when they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, we have sinned against the Lord. Now it seems that the repentance in verses two to four was an individual repentance. As people across the country, individually, a person here, a person there, a family, a village, it seems that that was an individual repentance as people turned to the Lord. Now they gathered together at Mizpah, a great meeting place in Israel's history. They gathered together at Mizpah, probably thousands of them. We're not given numbers. They gathered together at Mizpah for a time of, of corporate repentance. And the pouring out of water and the fasting were outward indications, outward expressions of that repentance, of that brokenness of heart. And they cry out with one voice, we have sinned against the Lord. There's a, there's a corporateness about their repentance. When you think of it as, as individual Christians, we, we need to confess. Confession and repentance should be part of our lives. There's repentance over particular sins. So for example, if I'm uh, wandering through Santon City and I see a gorgeous woman 
uh, showing too much skin and I lust after her and I fantasize in my head as I have been known to do as a fellow sinner, just so you know. Um, I need to repent over that. I need to go to God and say, God, forgive me. When I tell a lie in order to appear better than I am, I need to repent over that. That's a particular sin. But there are also patterns of sin that can come into our lives that we need to repent of. And those are sometimes more subtle and more difficult to deal with and recognize because they, you know, we can easily say, well, this is just the way I am. But we can have patterns of sin such as pride or fear or racism or indifference or laziness or the desire for uh, to be known, the neglect of the word of God, prayerlessness, lack of discipline, materialism. Those can be, those can be patterns that we don't easily recognize, but they're probably as damaging, if not more damaging, than particular sins that hit us in the face and we realize, oh, I really blew it there. But then there's also a need for corporate confession. When as a church we cry out, we have sinned against the Lord. We have a number of examples of this in the Old Testament, which we had time to look at them. We, have, we see Ezra, crying out, confessing the sin of their forefathers and their own sins. Just saying, God, we have sinned against you. We see the same with Nehemiah in the opening chapter, in the opening uh, chapter of that book where he prays. We see it in Daniel, in Daniel's wonderful prayer in chapter nine, just a couple of verses and example. As an example, Daniel prayed, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from you, your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name. We, 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 we. It's, there's a corporate, a corporateness about the confession. And the history of revival, both biblically and in subsequent church history, shows that when God really moves among his people, when God comes down, as it were, in his church, in a local church, one of the features of revival is corporate confession, where we say, oh God, forgive us. We have sinned against you. And where together we acknowledge our, the, the sins of our local church subculture, if you like. I wonder if God really moved among us, what sins would we need to confess? What sins would we as, as a pastoral team find ourselves confessing? What would we as a staff team need to confess? What would we as Elders need to confess. What would deacons need to confess? What would members of worship teams need to confess? What would community groups need to confess? What would happen in a community group if God really showed up? And you were on your knees on the carpet in someone's lounge saying, oh God, forgive us. We have not loved one another. We have gossiped about people when they weren't present. We have pretended to be better than we are. On and on we could go. We have sinned against the Lord. Those, those misper moments are needed and will happen when God really works in the life of the church. And at the same time, I long for that and I'm terrified by that, if I'm honest. We've looked at the preparation for God's mercy and that led to the manifestation of God's mercy. I told you the first part would be longer, now two shorter parts. 
Look at the manifestation of God's mercy. Verse seven. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack. The Philistines obviously thought that these Israelites gathering together en masse at Mizpah were planning some sort of revolt. And so they said, we need to launch a preemptive strike. We need to sort these guys out. They're not gonna rebel against us and come out from under our domination. And when the Israelites, verse seven, when the Israelites heard it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. And you can understand that, can't you? In the light of the two previous defeats in chapter four, and in the light of the fact that they'd been under Philistine domination for 20 years, now when the Philistine army is marshaled, the Israelites are afraid. But this time, it was different. This time it's different. They don't trust in themselves. They don't try to use the ark as some sort of a spiritual weapon. They don't send down to Kiriath Jireh and say, hey, Abinadab, let's have the ark again to see if it works this time. No, 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 they don't do that. What do they do? They turn to Samuel and they say to him, do not stop crying out to the Lord for us that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. The only weapon is prayer. And the only hope is that Samuel will somehow be able to put his hand on the throne of God through prayer and say, God, come down and help these people and deliver them. Verse nine, then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And he cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf. You picture the scene. Thousands of terrified Israelites, the Philistine army advancing. And there is one man, Samuel, and he lifts his hands to God on behalf of the people and he, and he cries out for mercy. And the text says the Lord answered him. The smoke of the sacrifice is ascending, the prayers of Samuel are ascending, and God comes down. The Lord answered him. The message of Samuel's sacrifice and, uh, and the message, in fact, of the entire Bible is twofold. No sinner may come before God's holiness without the atoning blood. And any sinner can come because of the precious blood of Christ. So Samuel's lamb was a picture of Christ our sacrifice. But interestingly, Samuel his, in himself is a picture of Christ our high priest making intercession for us as Samuel made intercession for the people. Ralph Davis says again, in Samuel's intercession on Israel's behalf, we see a picture of the office of Christ our high priest. Here is the true secret of our steadfastness. We rely on the prayers of another whose prayers are always effectual. Nothing is quite so moving as knowing that I am the subject of Jesus' intercessory prayers. And I have been encouraged by this even in the last 24 hours as I have tried to pray for the Tudor family in their massive grief. I have been encouraged in the knowledge that there is one at the Father's right hand who too is praying and who will give grace to help in this their time of need. So Samuel cried out to the Lord and the Lord answered, how, look at verse 10. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. And the men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to the point below Beth Kah. Oh, what a picture. I mean, imagine uh, a whole summer of high felt thunderstorms unleashed in one fell swoop. Wow! 
and the Philistines are disoriented and confused and the Israelites move in and slaughter them and God moves on behalf of his people. Everything is changed and it's because of God, not because of them. Following Samuel's dedication, you remember Hannah, his mother, after she had given him to the Lord, she prayed that wonderful prayer and part of it goes like this. She prayed, it is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. There it is. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And that's just what he did as he showed mercy to his repentant people. He thundered from heaven. That was his mercy to them in that particular time of need to deliver them from bondage to the Philistines. And when we're right with God, he will thunder on our behalf, whatever that thunder may mean in your particular circumstances or in mine or in that of our church. But oh, we need to hear thunder from heaven. But God works in answer to prayer when people's hearts are broken over their sin. The account concludes, just quickly, with the commemoration of God's mercy. Look at verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. And by erecting that memorial stone, Samuel was following in the footsteps of Joshua and others. You remember when the Israelites crossed the river Jordan, when God miraculously opened up the river, uh, Joshua said, take 12 stones, one representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel, build this monument. And in the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Then tell them about what God did to encourage them to continue to trust him as they move forward into the future. And Samuel follows that example of Joshua here. And so he erects the stone and he gives it a name. He calls it Ebenezer, which means stone of help. And he explains it. He says, thus far, thus far, the Lord has helped us. How far did that go back? I think it probably went right back to, uh, to the Exodus. And certainly it referred to the immediate thundering from heaven where the Lord had helped them. The idea of these memorials was that they would be a standing witness to what God had done in the past to encourage his people to trust them as they moved into the future. Ebenezer was the site of Israel's defeat in chapter four. Now, although the location is different, the stone Ebenezer is a memorial to God's victory. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. I think we as Christians need to make memorials. We need to have our own Ebenezers. I'm sure that you do. Maybe your Ebenezer is in the form of a memory. Whereas you face the future, you look back in your mind and you think of how God helped you in the past, how he came through for you in answer to prayer, giving you strength, providing your needs, granting healing, helping in times of temptation, comforting in times of grief, their memories. And those are, those are our personal Ebenezers. Maybe um, you keep your memories, your Ebenezers in a, in a journal. My wife, as I've told you before, is a great journaler. She's journaled all, every day uh, from the time I met her. We've got, in fact, I'm thinking of building on a, a room, another room in our house to contain all the journals because there's just stacks of them, her whole life, full of Ebenezer's in those journals. In fact, I'm, I'm praying that, uh, that I die first so that I won't have to contend with what do we do with all these journals My, uh, I'm not a great journaler, but most of my Ebenezer's are written in the margin of my Bible and previous Bibles, where I'll 
write down a date and something that God did or something that God said. And as I read, ah, there's, Eben, there's an Ebenezer. Maybe it's an ornament that you have. Some years ago when I was going through a difficult time, some friends were praying for me very, very specifically and they were in Kruger Park. And the wife prayed, oh God, please would you help Lee in this situation and to just confirm that you're gonna help him, let us see a leopard. I mean, I'm not too much into stuff like that, but as she, as she prayed that prayer, I mean, the, you know, you, don't, you can go to Kruger for many years and not see a leopard. As she prayed that prayer, a leopard walked across the road in front of her. She came back and told me and gave me a little pewter leopard, which I keep on my desk. And I look at it from time to time and I remember that is, in fact, I'm gonna call it Ebenezer. Uh, Ebenezer the leopard. Uh, just a reminder of God's faithfulness. Remember your Ebenezer's. When you face darkness going forward, when you face difficulty going forward, look back, look back. The Christian life is lived, is not lived in the past, but it needs to be lived in relation to the past. Never forget that. But of course, the supreme Ebenezer is the cross, the cross. And that's where we need to look again and again and again. As Justin reminded us in that opening verse, in this was demonstrated the love of God, that he gave his son for us and an atoning sacrifice for our sins. When we come month by month and we have the Lord's table set before us with the bread and the wine. That's Ebenezer. It's a reminder of the greatness of God's love and the guarantee that he will see us through to glory. We're going to sing a song as we finish. Come thou fount of every blessing. And we mean, when we normally sing it, we leave out the verse about Ebenezer because we think, well, people will think it's a cat or something. Uh, but since we've just talked about what Ebenezer is, um, we're gonna sing it with that verse in the hymn as a reminder. It says, here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come. And thy hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. As we finish, let me ask you, is there something in your heart that is saying, I miss him? Have you relegated the Lord to some curieth, gyrum, dorpy in some corner of your life? Oh, he's present but he's not central. And you've been worshiping other gods and allowing the world to conform you to its image. And the Lord this morning has said, you need to get rid of that. And you need to direct your heart to me. And that's gonna involve specific action, not just sentiment, but specific actions of change beginning today. Let's take a moment of quiet prayer for you to engage with God on that. And then in a couple of minutes, we're gonna to sing together. Let's be quiet and engage with the Lord together. And to sing in a moment, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. 
Amen.